So my presentation tonight is about the life story of Mother Delight Rice and her children. I'd like to, to show you, this is the name sign that everybody used, so when I use it, you'll remember that this refers to Delight Rice and more about her in just a moment. This is her picture. That's her signature. Her first name was actually Delia Wright, Delia Delight Rice, but she actually changed it somehow to just Delight Rice. I'm not sure if it's official or not, but she went by Delight Rice. On the far side, you see her with the foster child, and I think the child had a little cognitive problems. Um, you see that picture on the left side of the slide. On this slide, let me explain to you. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago into their public library, and people asked me about how I started all of this, and so I decided that I should add a little bit about me in here. Um, I met Delight when I was just an infant. My parents were getting a little worried because they gave birth to a deaf baby. And the doctor recommended that they should go meet Delight. So there I was just as an infant, as you see on the far left, and my parents met Delight, and that's been my story ever since my life with her. Um, her parents are shown here, her father Charles and mother Alice, also deaf. Both of them graduated from the Ohio School for the Deaf. Her father went on to Gallaudet in the class of 1879. He never completed his degree due to financial difficulties. On the far side of the slide, you see her and her younger brother, Percy. So you see Delight and her younger brother. On the slide here, you'll see the marriage certificate for her parents, who uh, the officiate there was the superintendent of the Ohio School for the Deaf, so you see that he's the one who performed the marriage uh, ceremony, and it's a very small town north of Columbus, Ohio. And below that, you'll see, um, you know, every year, we, you know, we had different census that were taken, and uh, we had one from the Alexander Graham Bell Association for the Deaf. They wanted a special census for deaf people. I'm not quite sure what their purpose was for asking that, but uh, there was a census. And you'll see that it was Dr. Fay, I believe it was. Let me, let me read the slide here to be, be sure. Hold on, I'll refer to my notes. I'm sorry, it was Dr. Edward Fay, who was an instructor at Gallaudet, wanted to have some statistics. So research was conducted for Alexander Graham Bell. So apparently, Alexander Graham Bell Association and Gallaudet had a good relationship in those years. You'll also see the name of Delight's mother and father there on the certificate. George was born July, something difficult to read, and died at the age of two, apparently some difficulty, maybe food poisoning or something, and then you'll see a third one that was Percy, so the middle child was Delight, and then the last one um, was Freeman. Well, actually, Charles the father, Charles Merrick Rice, had a son, Charles Freeman Rice, but it was too confusing to have too many Charles in the family, so they just referred to him as Freeman. Because if you look down the family lineage, there were an awful lot of Charles, so they decided to simplify that and call him Freeman. <coughs> On this slide, you'll see where Delight graduated from high school, Columbus, uh, Ohio. She then went on to Gallaudet, where they had established the normal school. And she submitted an application, never really heard from them, so decided to go to the Columbus Normal School, 
graduated from there, and then was in a teacher training program at the Ohio School for the Deaf, and then moved on to Wisconsin, to the School for the Deaf there, as a teacher for the deaf and blind, so a specialized teacher for the deaf and blind. And you'll see some of the, the interesting dates and uh, titles there on the slide. And you'll see that's her picture, the one that I'm referring to, trying to circle with the red dot. I'm sure you can see, recognize her face. And in this slide, we talk about the Helen Kellers. Now, when Delight was 22, she taught these three girls. So she started at that program at the age of 18, but at the age of 22, she started to become a teacher about these three girl, with these three girls. Um, and back then, that's pretty much true to this day, um, the teacher would sit one-on-one -on -one with the students, but sometimes in the case of Delight, she sat one teacher with three students. I don't know how she did it, it was amazing. But uh, she wasn't sure if they could understand color. So she talked about the flag of the US with the red and white stripes and the blue square with the stars. And somehow she was able to convey color to students who never could see color. And she was able to convey that to them. It was remarkable. You see Anna Johnson on the far left. She actually visited California uh, to Berkeley. And uh, she visited, Anna Johnson visited Mother Delight Rice. Um, she learned Braille and worked for several hours. Uh, then, I have to say, she was gifted. She was quite a proficient writer. Despite being deaf and blind, she being quite skilled at the art of writing. On the far left, you see a picture of Delight when she was a teacher in Wisconsin. And I'm not sure which of the two on the right it was, but one of them Delight took to the World's Fair in 1905, I believe it was. So she took them around and used tactile signing in their hand and explained everything that was there on the grounds of the World's Fair. Amazing. Here we have the CAID, the Convention of American Instructors for the Deaf. Uh, in 1905, you have a picture of the attendees. And included in the group, we have Delight Rice there with her head slightly to the side, right above that arrow, and some other faces you might recognize. Edward Minor Gallaudet, you know, being the first uh, president of Gallaudet University of College at the time. And in the book, I, there's a photo album that uh, I was allowed to look at, and I, it was a huge picture, but I was able to shrink it down to fit into a slide. Now, it's interesting because Delight left the Wisconsin School for the Deaf, went to Ohio, worked there teaching the deaf-blind students, uh, then went on to the Ohio School for the Deaf, and it was called the Ohio Chronicle which was their newsletter, a uh, local town newsletter. And they had a test for you know, civil service, people who wanted to work. Uh, and one of them was for civilians to go work in the Philippines. And so you know, it was that time of the Mexican-American War, 1896, and uh, the Philippines were occupied. So they called many people, uh, including many American teachers, to go to the Philippines. So she saw this uh, advertisement to take the civil service exam, and she applied, took the test, passed it the first time, and was there for a salary. It was 2,000, no, 1,000. Well, I can't remember the exact number, but it was somewhere between one and 2,000 for a year, dollars per year. And then, so she started in January 1907, left the US, head for the Philippines, uh, maybe in May or June. She, she left from San Francisco by boat, by ship, I should say, uh, arrived in June. So it took about 25 days, 25 days on a ship to get from San Francisco to the Philippines. Now we fly in a matter of hours. Anyway, she was there, and there were a lot of American teachers. And she, she, she said, well, where are Delight's children? 
you know, because people had heard about her and the government had spent all this money and she wondered where all the deaf people were. And, you know, she looked around and uh, Delights decided that she should make a request of the Philippine government to conduct yet another census to see how many deaf students there were. And they said only one or two. She decided that she would go look for herself. She met this one man, who had a deaf wife, and they found out that there were a few other deaf people. But the thing was, most of them were hidden away. They were not easily noticed. In the Philippines, they have a very strong fear of God and God's retribution. And if someone was deaf, that means they were being punished by God, or the parents were being punished by some act that they had done, and they had given birth to deaf people as a result of their shameful deed. So she worked long and hard to find the deaf children on the island. There were members of the US military that went over with her, and she would hike in the mountains. Now, don't forget, at that time, they had headhunters. Despite that, she'd walk among them, and she go, I think, 1,000 or 2,000 miles and would find these children and eventually brought them back to a central location and was able to establish a school there. Oh, I almost forgot to add that Delight had an interpreter as she went to the various tribes, and she thought, I don't need one because I can gesture very well, and these people will understand me. I don't need an interpreter. So she dismissed the interpreter. Brave woman. Here we see the first school for the deaf, and this was established by the government. And um, they had the students lined up, and they had the dorms, and they had places for them to eat and sleep. And you see the, the first class, a picture of them there. And see a picture of Delight. You can see her off to the far left. And, and I should explain a little bit more to you about Lightman, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And you see another woman. Uh, we have Francisca, and I'm sorry, I forget the gentleman's name. Let me look this up. Oh, you know what? I, it's Rogerio Lightman. Um, they were in Mexico. in Mexico City which is in the Philippines, Mexico City in the Philippines. And they taught the blind. Now, they both spoke English very well. And it was the American soldiers who taught them English. And then Francisco's sister um, acted as his eyes. So she would uh, do everything you know, visually for him, very faithful to her brother. And Delight saw that and offered them a job in Manila to teach the deaf and blind children there, which they agreed to do, and relocated. She knew that they needed more training, so she sent them to CSD, the California School for the Deaf, in Berkeley in 1909, and I'll talk more about that, so that they could learn more and further their education before going back. Emerita was the first school for the deaf, and believe it or not, uh, had enrollment that filled their classrooms to capacity. They needed to relocate, and this is a new location, which was near the Manila Cathedral. And the Manila Cathedral was very old, and I know that Stan Smith and his, parent, his parents actually uh, served in the Navy and were married in this very cathedral. Imagine that, and this was in the 1920s. So this school ended up having enrollment to capacity, and they moved to an area that was full of mangroves. And they had to build a wharf, they had to build the streets, and not far from the, the school. They actually had to build a city so the students could come to the, to the classrooms. The Mexican uh, government gave this property to the school for the children. There was a swimming hole and, and areas for the children to have recreation and classrooms. 
in the spring, they would learn about farming and they learned about different birds and agriculture in addition to classroom exercises. This school also became filled to capacity and they moved to Passe City, which is south of Manila. And an American woman was the holder of this land and she granted that to the school. Um, I think it was about, I believe it was $50,000, I think, for them to construct the school and that's the school that still stands to this day. But anyway, in the top picture, when the building was just barely uh, finished being constructed, uh, she stood there for a picture and they soon opened their doors and it was called the School for the Deaf and Blind, SDB. And later was changed to the, to the Philippine School for the Deaf and Blind, um, and then School for the Deaf when the, when the blind students were set to another campus. And that's the school that's here uh, in the present time. When the school was done being constructed, she moved to Berkeley. Let me move away from the podium for a moment here. Up in the top corner, you see Rogerio Lagman. He was the one who taught the deaf and blind students I referred to, and then his sister, Francisca. And then the next one is Paula uh, Delight went to the school. Uh, I'm sorry, Delight sent Paula to the school and shortly afterwards she got married and uh, Delight said, sorry, that's not a condition I'll accept, you need to come back home. Pablo Santos was another student who came to Berkeley, but there were a lot of issues that he quarreled over. Um, you know, um, he kept saying about how he was going to go into Gallaudet and did a lot of bragging about himself. And if you look on the Gallaudet records, he never really enrolled there. He was never accepted at Gallaudet. And the people, even Delight, were, was shocked back in the Philippines to find out that he never actually, after all his bragging, never officially enrolled at Gallaudet. However, on the good side of this, um, he became a principal, uh, I'm sorry, he became one of the leaders of the Philippine Association for the Deaf. Some of these faces you may recognize on the slide. Bernardo uh, was, I have to say this, but he, it was Delight's pet. She would just mother over him. She was his pet. He was her pet. Um, he went into the School for the Deaf in Berkeley, along with uh, Lester Naftali, whose picture is over here. Some of you know him. Some of you are familiar with Lester. Um, anyway, Bernardo and Lester uh, went to school together. Lester was born in the Philippines a long time ago. He and his, his family uh, were refugees from uh, Russian Jews from uh, Soviet Russia and, and fled to the Philippines. And uh, was famous for being a stunt pilot and um, after all of that still never could find a job despite his talent. Then uh, Bernardo was a boxer. He loved taking anybody on and having boxing matches. He enrolled at the School for the Deaf in Berkeley, got on the football team, and Freeman, Delight's brother, actually taught him official boxing, but he was injured in football and so never really went on very far in his boxing career. He got married to uh, someone from Gallaudet. Then moving to the bottom row, the four pictures at the bottom. Li all four of these lived in California. Uh, the first one, George Adeltweed. Attended public school. And you know, Delight would always go around to the schools and try to see where the deaf children were. And she looked at George Adeltweed and thought there was something wrong. Uh, with him because he, he didn't speak, he didn't have any language, asked the school, they said, oh yes, he's mentally retarded. And she could not believe that. She felt he was just deaf and so she had him enroll at the school and he progressed quite well and went on to become a dean at Ohlone College. He was also involved in the theater, he had a television production. Let me see if I can get the exact name of that for you.
The television program was called Silent Perspectives, and it had won an Emmy Award, and he was the producer and director of that, despite his humble beginnings. And next is me, of course. We have Jeanette Davis, the third picture here. Um, there were other children in the family, um, several of them who attended the School for the Deaf in Berkeley, and then Daniel Lynch being the fourth picture that you see up there. Delight tried to convince uh, the Lynch family. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of trouble, you know, as far as custody and had to deal with the courts. So, I don't know, Dan and I were playing outside and uh, Delight was able to convince his mother. Um, and just before, his mother taught speech. And um, so, after he had some speech, then she was more easily convinced that uh, he should go to the School for the Deaf. He became very involved with APTC. He went to Gallaudet to graduate uh, on, and his mother kept teaching speech even after he was a graduate of Gallaudet College. She decided she would continue to teach speech even though it was obvious he didn't need that for his education. Delight was a pioneer in audiology, too, because it was fairly new in the 30s. You have to think about the technology back then and all. And she got this equipment, uh, one of the two pieces of equipment in the entire state of California. And she started working in audiology and learning um, uh, what it took and teaching others about audi audiology. When she retired at the age of 65 and moved on to Los Angeles, and she gave a presentation at the Hearing Society of Los Angeles, and she thought she was only going to be there a short time, but she stayed on there for an entire year and was able to instruct 10,000 people on how to, to uh, give hearing exams and so on. Very successful career. When she worked in LA, she became a manager of the California Home for the Deaf, which was on Menlo Street. It had moved. Uh, and so she actually became a, a manager there, and during the summers, during her summer break, so to speak, she would volunteer teaching in the University of the Pacific for teachers who were pursuing a degree in audiology and show them how to conduct hearing exams, and even people who had PhDs, she would teach them, and if there was someone who was invited as a guest speaker, she was selected over those who had a doctorate, so she was very successful. This here um, may be something you are familiar with, the internment camps uh, from World War II, you know, after December 7th and the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It hit many of us, in, it impacted us in a, in a very serious way. On the evening of December 7th, I remember uh, my father was listening to the radio and I was watching him and all of a sudden he changed. He got so emotional. He was standing up and screaming and crying and I didn't know what was going on until the next day when I saw the newspaper. And in February they were all taken to an internment camp and of course they were worried about me. Uh, and so my dad asked Delight if she could become a guardian so that I could stay in California and continue attend, attend the School for the Deaf in Berkeley, which she accepted. I got permission from the FBI uh, to become uh, her foster child, so to speak. Um, imagine there I was in this household where nobody looked Japanese, nobody looked like me, their, fo fo their food was nothing that I was used to eating, but despite that, it changed my life. Because um, remember, there was no captioning, there was nothing, uh, interpreters on television, and so I learned so much from her. I was in a signing environment. Prior to that, I didn't know anything about the, the Congress at Milan. I didn't know about George Vaditz. I didn't know about any of this. It was when I lived with her that she told me all these stories of, of famous deaf people and all the hard work they did. And I am so grateful to her for doing that for me. On the right side, you see a picture of my dad with several of us. There's my brother, Bobby, who's sitting here with us tonight, waving his hand at you. Uh, that's my brother. Then um, you'll see uh, 
other members of my family here. Uh, and then you'll, on this side, you'll see my mother and my, my aunt. And there's Bobby, and there's me, and my brother Dan, and, and other siblings who are all still alive. Uh, I am the oldest. Uh, second in line is Bobby, and then other siblings after us. My brothers and sisters and my family had to go to Topaz internment camp. And they're the ones who encouraged me to write a book. And so I decided to do this one first, and the next thing they want me to do is write an autobiography. So that's next on my to-do list. This is very interesting. Agatha Teagle Hansen was chosen as one of the leaders at Gallaudet. She was the first woman to graduate from Gallaudet. When you go on the campus, you see these banners of the women leaders, and her picture and everything is up there. Delight had done so much. She had so much of her time that she contributed, interpreting and, and doing all of this for the deaf community. So I wrote a letter to the president of Gallaudet and said you know, that she should get an honorary degree. And so she did. Oh, I'm sorry, Agatha Hansen wrote the letter, and we're so grateful that she did. She got her honorary degree, and that year was the same year that I graduated from Gallaudet, so it was nice that the two of us were together. You know, at Gallaudet, there is a tradition that you, you get your diploma, but instead of handing it to me, they handed it to Delight, and so I broke with tradition, and it was her, so instrumental in my life. She was the one who gave it to me. Very moving experience. Richard West came to visit to Delight's house, um, and that's at a time that I was living there, and was strongly encouraging her to go to the Philippines. So she went back September 1961. And you would not believe the number of people that showed up for this event. It had been 37 years since she was there before. When she got there, her students, her pupils, were standing there. And you know, they, it, they went over, she would have to go over to each of their homes. They would invite her over for dinner because, of course, they had to honor her for all the work that she'd done. So rather than being there for a simple week or so, she was there several months. She actually stayed until the month of March. And she was planning to go home, but the government actually gave her some funding. I believe it was the Tourist Bureau that gave her some funding so that she could fly through Asia to... Israel to Europe, they gave her money so that she could visit these schools for the deaf and blind throughout various continents. That was their way of thanking her for all the work that she had done so many years ago. When she died, she, her remains were brought to the Milfordton uh, cemetery, very small town in Ohio. You'll see that her brother and her parents are also buried there. It's a family plot. I went to the 100 year anniversary. Uh, Stan Smith and I actually went for this auspicious occasion. And you can see in the picture um, there, I had actually given a tribute to my mother, to, to Delight. I did my presentation, and then Stan uh, Smith also gave the history of CAD, a book that was written uh, as a gift to the Philippine uh, government and the school. Uh, up at the top, you'll see that there was a stamp that was minted in her honor, and it was uh, drawn by students at the school. Here's my book ready for distribution, and I have uh, here, I've brought a box with me, so while you're eating the, uh, recept the food at the reception, you can purchase a book. I'm happy to sign it for you. And that's my closing remarks, sayonara.
I took a picture of myself. There's a selfie at the Golden Gate Bridge. 